Welcome everyone to our eighth in the series of 10 free talks to get your business ready for the digital and physical opportunities of 2021 and beyond. These talks have been created by the Crafts Council and have been funded by Crafting Europe. We have translation options available for those from the Ukraine. And for any questions throughout this talk, please use our Q&A function. We will be recording and this, will, this talk alongside the rest of our Spring Back Talks are available on our YouTube channel, Crafts Council. Before I welcome our guests, Stephen Clark and Kimberly Chandler, I would like to set some context about getting the um, most of your writing skills in relation to your business. I always start with the rationale and why. In this digital age, writing about what we do has become ever more important. We are not asking you to become authors or journalists. We are just recommending that you can reconsider reviewing how you write about your work. Easy to say, hard to do. Why is it important? The answer is simple. If you want to sell your work and help others to understand what you do, communication is the key. And writing backs up all of your visual impact. Soon we'll be hearing from Stephen and Kimberly to offer top tips on how. Research. Firstly, what do you need writing for? This could be your website, social media, newsletters, or even an application. For statements, look to artists and makers that you admire. How do they describe their work? Look for their structure of how they've written their pieces, not necessarily the content itself. For editorial, look to written pieces that inspire you. Crafts Magazine is a really good place to start. For grant applications, consider looking at the whitecube.co.uk forward slash funding library. Again, look at structure and not the content specifically. For social media, think about the action you want people to take following your posts. This can be a short point, it could be an offering insight. Either way, it does not need to be complex. Marketing. Writing backs up your visual impact. Take, for example, your homepage of your website. Do you have a statement that inspires people to connect? Need some help? Refer to our first talk on identifying your brand values. This will help you identify your mission statement. With all writing, whether a direct message, a newsletter, a press release or an application, does your writing get straight to the point? Structure. Allow yourself time to work on your writing skills. Always worth asking someone else to read it. This could be a fellow maker, a past tutor, or a family member. Sometimes asking someone who knows nothing about what you do can be a great idea. If it makes sense to them, you've got it nailed. Consider setting aside budget to pay a professional for support. This could be somebody to help you write your grant application, help you write press releases, or content for your website. But remember, if you're going down this route, work out a brief of what you want to achieve and work with the professional to coax out all the important information you need to have the impact that you want that writing to have. Planning. Always good to have a deadline. This could be anything from writing an application for a grant or applying for a gallery opportunity. Remember, if you're doing applications, selectors look at your website. So always worth factoring in a review of your statement 
and about pages on your website, which will be used to back up those all important applications. Connections. Good structured writing helps with clear communication. So who do you want to connect to? For an exhibition or event that you're setting up, this could be past people that have shown interest in what you do. For press releases, this could be a specific editor or a journalist. Start building these lists and decide how you want to connect to them. Always worth getting personal names where possible. Whatever your approach, taking the time to structure according to who you are writing to would be worth it in the end. Finally, the future. Writing does not come naturally to everyone, but we still need the skills to support all the work we do for our respective businesses. If you structure writing, allow yourself time to work in it, to try and alleviate stress that it might bring. Know when to ask for help and allow time for that help to respond. Always having an idea of where you want your business to go will help identify where you want to place your efforts. For example, writing is tough enough. If you're trying to apply for an opportunity, does it fit your business goals? You may find yourself struggling even more if you are trying to write for an opportunity that doesn't quite fit. So think about that for the future. I will now hand over to Dr. Stephen Knott and Dr. Kimberly Chandler, who will be sharing their top tips and insight on how to hone your writing skills. Hello there. Hi there. Hello. Hi. We're just going to start by um, sharing the screen um, and put our presentation on. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I see what I need to see. There we go. So hopefully you can uh, see the, um, the opening slide there. I hope everything's coming over clearly and you can hear us okay. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> okay, so. Hello, I'm Kimberly Chandler, an independent researcher, writer, and editor. And I'm Stephen Knott, and uh, most of the time I'm a lecturer in the Critical and Historical Studies Department at Kingston University, and um, one of the editors of the Journal of Modern Craft. Um, in 2018, we decided, Kimberly and I, to partner up and bring together our freelance activities under the name of Tandem. And our aim is to broaden understanding about craft and materiality through research, writing, teaching, and talking. Um, so for example, we recently comp compiled a catalog of examples of useful craft for Grisdale Arts, um, which is based in the Lake District. However, running sessions with making, sorry, running sessions with makers about writing has become one of the key things that we do, both within our respective university roles and together in co collaborative workshops, uh, for example, the MA Design and Maker students at Camberwell College of Art, and with the Crafts Council for their crafting business scheme, as well as their forebear hot house. So we've been thinking quite a lot about writing, um, but particularly writing for craftspeople, like craftspeople writing and makers writing. So we have been long interested in this kind of theme. However, at the outset, it is important to emphasize that we are not experts in your particular area of what writing will be. And honing your writing skills really depends on what kind of writing you are doing at the moment and what you want to achieve. So for this session, we're, we're not gonna really focus so much on grammar or syntax. That'll make for a fairly dull talk. Um, instead, we want to talk about working with words and how you as makers can get the most out of writing and develop your written voice. And to help us with the talk today, we've asked several fellow craft professionals that, that write. So these are curators, writers, editors, and artists to offer up their own tips, um, which we have scattered out, uh, scattered about through our talk um, while keeping their, keeping their names anonymized. <laughs> so we thought, we'd like, we thought we'd start with something that has provided a soundtrack to our lives over the last few months a song by the American New Wave band, the Tom Tom Club, 
released in 1981 titled Word and Latin Hood. The song opens with the sound of a typewriter and goes on to playfully explore the creative potential and pleasure of words. So here's a short excerpt. Words in papers, words in books, words on TV, words for crooks, words of comfort, words of peace, words to make the fighting cease, words to tell you what to do, words are working hard for you. Eat your words but don't go hungry, words have always nearly hung me. So Tina Weymouth of the Tom Tom Club has explained how words have a funny way of limiting what you think is possible and this song was a response to that. And it's just something that we'd like you to keep in mind as you write. If you don't know the song, look it up. But it's a very playful take on the ideas of, of working with words and playing with words and having fun with words. So um, we'd also like to briefly acknowledge the writing of several makers who we believe are also skilled writers, starting with the weaver Annie Albers who use technical descriptions and terminology to poetic effect within her writing. We would strongly recommend her book On Weaving, which is a meditation on weaving, its history, tools and techniques. But here is a text from 1965, in which she discusses the notion of tactile sensibility. We particularly like her use of words such as ground and chipped and crushed and powdered and mixed and sliced and likening our abbreviated understanding of materials to, quote, merely toasting the bread. It's very playful and very straightforward, and we think a particularly good example. The second example that we've uh, presented today is the work of uh, ceramist uh, Phoebe Cummings. Um, and this was a, a, a sort of passage of text that you can see in the next slide where she talks about her practice and uh, her engagement with materials around her. Um, and it's a piece of writing that was written in 2015 for the Journal of Modern Craft in the Statement of Making section, sorry, Statement of Practice section, where makers have a real chance to uh, have a freedom of a few thousand words to talk about how they relate to their making. I, I just wanted to bring up this particular extract because it has a real sense of uh, motion and, and moving and there's a lot of first person in here. Uh, it re relates very much to the, the kind of, uh, but it's a very personal piece of writing and it sort of draws you along with it. It kind of takes you on a journey effectively. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, kind of ING words in there as well that kind of help you kind of navigate through. But I was particularly struck by how this journey, if you keep reading through it, and I won't read it all out, but it kind of ends in this very interesting notion of uh, gradual, automation, which is in there in this or gradually automatic in the second paragraph in the second sentence. It's like there's this kind of journey towards a kind of moment where the, uh, where the artist, where Phoebe Cummings is able to kind of slip into sort of an automation, but it's not got any of the negative associations that we normally have for that word that's kind of often tied to mass production and things that we as craftspeople and crafts interested in craft don't really associate with. So she's built us up towards this kind of really interesting use of a very short term, gradually automatic. Next, we have, of course, uh, British ceramist Alison Britton, who's well known as both a writer and artist. And what we like about Alison's writing in particular is the way in which her voice really comes through in the text. You can almost hear her speaking to you. And in this particular text from 2011, she addresses the use of words to conjure up ideas for the repurposing of objects, making a good case for the ways in which words and materials are interchangeable or corresponding. And we wouldn't really be able to uh, kind of forget or not mention Evan Duval just because he is uh, the craftsman who's best, probably more known for his writing than he is for his making. Um, and you can kind of tell why through his very accessible language that he uses in his writing. Uh, particularly, and he's very good at kind of um, uh, modeling the writing or tailoring the writing to his audience. So um, he can write uh, very academically. He's very well known um, for a biography of Bernard Leach, for example, but he's able to kind of put that voice aside and take on a completely different voice, which takes you again, a bit like Phoebe's work, straight to what he's doing in the studio. 
So, so with all of these, um, we just simply want to suggest that you can study and learn from writers that you admire, and it's good to spend time with these texts, um, do a close reading of them, and just try and understand what it is you like and what you don't like. It's a really good way, place to start. Um, okay, so we've divided our um, talk um, amongst sort of three, yeah. three themes. The first one is um, vocabulary. Um, so one of the first things we'd like to suggest is that you try to avoid overused words and phrases. This is something we often say to makers in our workshops, as it can be very easy to fall back on seemingly crafty words that actually offer very little in the way of specificity or indeed poetry. We've compiled a list of words um, from over the last three years working with the Crafts Council Hothouse Programme, crafting business, as well as art school students, and these are words we say time and again and feel strongly that there are better words that can be used when talking about craft. So um, the list reads traditional, style, aesthetic, meaningful, artisanal, honest, personal, innovative, distinctive, hand tools or handmade, authentic, practice, unique, beautifully crafted function, timeless, one-off, nature. And this is not to suggest that these words are useless, but just that there might be better words to describe what it is you're trying to get at when you put these words in context. Um, yeah, and they kind of, sometimes they just, just to butt in there, <laughs> they kind of um, don't do you justice in the sense that they seem like the right words to select to describe what you do. But often there's better, more unique or distinctive ways of, sort of saying the thing you want to say. It's almost like we fall we tend to fall back on these words in the world of craft to sort of do all the communication where actually it's about what making work those words work a bit harder think about alternatives yes so for example with traditional what kind what what kind of tradition if handmade what is that hand doing when making and what actions are the hands performing so these are all just subtleties and nuances that will help you to uh build a sort of a better or, or a, 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 a vocabulary that will work harder for you. Um, and alongside this, we have a few phrases um, like um, inspired by nature, working outside the box, pushing boundaries or expressing the human condition, all of which again are fairly generic and could be written more succinctly. And I think we've got to think about the use of words in the context of how craft as a word and words associated with it that we've already shown. This has been subject in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years to an increasing sense of overuse by commercial companies or the commercial context. This goes by the phrase of uh, craft washing that academics, Anthea Black and Nicole Barish, Barish have uh, termed. And this is when a large corporation or company uses craft terminology to sell to us. A good example is Pret's lovingly handmade um, lovingly handmade slogan uh, and Fuji Water's natural artis artisan water. And so these are things that the companies are trying to do to attract us and sort of convince us that they are using good practices um, of production, making sure they look after their workers, good use of materials, all those things that we associate with craft, but uh, perhaps have slightly dubious um, justification for using such words. This is the broader context of the word craft in our current culture. So it's almost um, puts upon you as makers the demand to actually think harder about what this word means and to convince the reader that you are genuinely <laughs> uh, crafting. Um, so it's just that commercial context that I think is really important. How will you make your words work harder to fully convey what you do and distinguish your practice? And next, we'd like to suggest that you shouldn't be afraid to write about technique. We believe that when it comes to craft, there is a lot of poetry in specifically technical descriptions and in technical terminology, provided that difficult terms are explained to the reader. We would encourage the full use of this vocabulary that's relevant to your particular practice, rather than relying on what you might think the market demands. 
for example, authentic local traditional handmade. Again, perhaps the greatest writer that uses technicalities to convey the importance of an object is Annie Albers, whom we mentioned earlier. So do have a look at her writing if you can. And um, just to bear in mind, the reader might not want to hear all the technicalities of your practice, as this can be fairly complex. But nevertheless, process is something that's so specific to each of you and could be considered one of your greatest assets when it comes to uh, approaching writing. The next section um, where we kind of bracketed our advice under is voicing. So before you, this is a quote from the British author Robert McFarlane, and he said, before you become a writer, you must first become a reader. Every hour spent reading is an hour spent learning to write. So we often forget that writing is not simply writing, but also reading. Um, you, you are made aware of what you are writing about through continual reading and then editing. So we would like to suggest that this places a huge demand on the writer to be both inside and outside the text at the same time, writer and reader. Another idea that closely follows this is to read more and to read widely, not just novels, but non-fiction, poetry, cookbooks. This is just Robert McFarlane for you. Vernacular signs, creative writing, etc. While working, um, for example, on my PhD, I was acutely aware that the more that I read, the more expansive my writing became. So the vocabulary that I was picking up seemed to be seeping into my writing and I felt much more confident uh, in the writing process. So noting down um, nice quotes or phrases or, or terms of sort of the way that words are put together um, in a notebook is quite good practice. And then you can refer to those when, um, when you're doing your writing. Um, and that can be a really nice way of um, constructing a different vocabulary for yourselves. Mm. So thinking about um, other kind of practical tips in this area of voicing, um, what you could do, this is a common thing that I often recommend, is reading aloud. Um, this can be done both to record your own talking so that you can come up with words to put down on the page. So transcribing your own recordings. Um, being, be conscious of reading as you write, just read aloud to yourself, read the text aloud. And this is the best way of making sure that you pick up on any errors uh, in terms of grammar, but also in terms of the tone, like how you sound when you're being read as a writer. Um, you know, it's, it's quite revealing when someone else picks up your text and they read it and it sounds awful. <laughs> and you know you've got to do some editing and some work on that. So really reading aloud, voicing those words is really helpful. And then we would encourage you to share your writing with others. Um, so whether that is a friend, uh, a group of friends or studio colleagues, uh, talk about what you're writing about to those around you, because writing is very much about um, externalising what's in your mind. So in that sense, the more you talk about it with others, the more feedback you get and that can make for better writing. Um, for example, um, for the crafting business um, exercise that we recently did, um, we encouraged makers to pair, pair up and we asked them to talk to each other about their practice. And for the person listening to witness um, the kinds of vocabulary that the other, their, their, their other was um, using to describe their work. And this, um, then you can share the words that you've noted down with each other. And I guess it's just a way of becoming aware of yourself um, and understanding how you are, how well you articulate your practice and whether there are better ways to describe what you do. Um, and likewise, we've run workshops where we've asked participants to come up with a list of key words or short phrases between three and seven that are very specific to their work. And these will help you develop the more generic phrases that we mentioned earlier or nuancing them into something more focused and more useful. Um, so the more frequently you can speak about the work, your work and examine what you mean by what you say, the better you'll write. Um, and two eyes or two ears, four ears are always, four eyes, four are always eyes. better four. than two. <laughs> okay, so editing. This is absolutely vital um, in terms of uh, becoming or writing effectively. So alongside reading, reading to write well depends on editing. I feel like, feel like sometimes this is analogous to the finer parts of stone or wood carving or indeed concrete carving that you can see here. 
but you're chiseling out the detail, removing superfluous material, checking over many times how something looks. It seems appropriate, this kind of idea of carving, because usually editing involves taking away uh, material rather, rather than adding more, because we all tend to write too much uh, in response to a brief or a task, as if kind of a, a volley or a splurge of words will somehow do and satisfy the reader. But really, editing is so key, you need to go over text again and again and again to ensure good writing. And spend some time away from it and mm. come back to it as well, even if that means a, a period of a few days or a week, it's always helpful to leave it to sit and come back to it. Mm. So in terms of, uh, sort of practical tips on how to achieve that, you might um, want to uh, vary the length of your sentences. Um, so you want to have like long sentences combined with short ones, then medium-sized ones. It seems quite an obvious thing to say, but you want to make sure that each sentence has a kind of different uh, sort of tone or sound. You don't want each sentence to sound the same as all the other ones. You could put in a punch, uh, put in a few punchy short sentences to summarise a point, to conclude. In, in between uh, a tracks of description or analysis, you could introduce a question here and there to keep your kind of reader awake, alert, and on their toes. And also use the full range of punctuation to make sure that there's variety within each paragraph of your writing. Um, this is um, a particular bugbear of mine, I have to say. There is no excuse for sloppiness. Um, despite the creative potential of words, there is a formality to writing, and there's codes and there's systems. Try to read samples of the kinds of writing that you seek to emulate and make good use of your dictionary and thesaurus. One of the, well, several things that I find particularly hard when I'm editing um, other people's writing is uh, misspelled names. Um, it's amazing how common that is. And also the use of proper nouns, place names, etc., and also getting the capitalization right. And that links to my next point about the consistency. So if you capitalise something in one instance, you need to capitalise in the next and so on. Otherwise, it does appear very sloppy. Correct dates are really important. Um, and overwordy sentences, again, linking to that idea of editing, edit them down. And I think really what we're seeing here is a kind of casualness in the text that perhaps um, seeps in from... Uh, text messaging and other kinds of um, social media, um, which in some instances might work depending on what you're what you're writing and what you're doing. But on the whole, I think um, it's good to try and keep um, consistent and um, professional in t in terms of your writing and the tone of writing. And on that, there's a very good book that we can recommend: um, "Each Shoots and Leaves" by Lynn Truss. So if you haven't um, in fact, yes, I haven't read yeah, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's um, um, a very good kind of book to sort of, it, it's a very fun book, let's put it that way. It, it's not a boring book and it's um, really helpful in terms of realising how, how English what works, written English works as a language, uh, its codes and its operations and common pitfalls. Because I think as with anything, once you've learned the system, then you can play with it. Mm. I think that's important to, to learn. So this actually what Kim was just saying just a minute ago about text speak or social media speak, I think uh, this is kind of, I think, speaks to a lot of issues. I'm sure that all of you are kind of writing in different contexts for different purposes and many of you are writing social media and Instagram posts and whatever. It's not the kind of area of expertise or specialism on my part at all. Um, uh, I'm just very fascinated by short forms of writing. But really the most important thing is to be aware of the audience and be aware of like the differences between print and screen and the media, or the medium, sorry, in which your writing will appear. Will it only appear virtual? Will it be printed on a, in a book or will it be printed on a, a press release or will it only stay online? I think these are kind of really important things to consider. Um, one of the pieces of advice that were given to us is always uh, print out the writing that you do uh, to find out uh, any, to make sure it sounds good and to proofread it with you know, pen and paper because there's a kind of certain tactility or viscerality to that that we might help with the process of writing and might help kind of become more edited. Um, I personally kind of vary between the two things, like sometimes there's no time to edit 
with pen and paper, you just have to do it on Acrobat Reader. Um, so it's, it's kind of either or, but in an ideal world, I probably would follow that advice. Um, and also, if, if it wasn't so bad to be thinking about this paper. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, and I just, I, I apologise for putting that no, on a bit too fine. quickly, but um, our final um, tip in this section is that titling is the ultimate edit. So all of you, or most of you, I think, would be um, titling your work. Um, it's an essential written component of your practice for which words are key um, and we would just suggest that you think very carefully about the titling of your work because I think it can make or break a piece. I mean maybe it's, people will have um, um, comments on that but for me um, I certainly feel that the two are so intertwined. It's, um, so it's, it's an example of where editing and thinking very carefully about words is very integral to what you do as makers mm. and it's really interesting just on that point that you know you're, with your work which is various and we can't see any of it in this context but it's going to be very complex and it takes you ages to do and then at the end of it you've got to come up with a word a title a, sh a short set of words to kind of somehow encapsulate that and that puts a huge demand on you to become very good editors so i think being conscious of that fact and you know how you, you know we haven't had to do that we don't make work so it's, you know, we can be quite sort of verbose and use lots of words, but you've already done those of editing. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're coming towards the end of the talk and we just had a few final thoughts that we wanted to share. Um, so try to open with something that grabs the reader's attention. This is always, um, I mean, for myself, if I'm, if I'm in a book, bookshop and I'm picking up a book and thinking to buy it, I often read the first paragraph just to see if I'm being drawn in and I think it's the same with any other form of writing so do try and think very carefully about your hook if you like how you're going to bring that reader in mm. and that applies to all different types of writing whether it's funding applications or yes. more kind of exhibition catalogs um, and this is a point really about the uh, if you're talking about your work um, you want to be mindful of directing the reader too much like saying what your work is about uh, very directly without letting the reader decide what the work is about. So I think it's important to don't say your work is this or that colourful or thought provoking, but try to indicate this through the use of other words. Next, um, a little tip from one of our colleagues, try doing the Guardian's quick, cross, quick, quick crossword from time to time. And again, this is just about um, playing with words, thinking about new words, words that you haven't um, come across for a while. And, um, and again, often um, when I'm reading something, I think, oh, that's a very nice word. Maybe I'll try and fit that into something that I'm writing about at a later stage. So it's just about expanding that vocabulary again. And yeah, and a really important um, thing to do, I think Caroline mentioned this early on, is to, to kind of mm -hmm. understand that writing is quite a difficult thing, you know, every, it, that's okay. Um, so do look after yourself when you write. When you write. It's often a frustrating process writing. Um, and if you get writer's block or the blank page, the best thing to do is to just leave the room for a while and do something else. It's really hard because you feel feel like you're onto something when you read, oh, I'll just get that next sentence done and then it will all sort itself out. But sometimes you can end up finding yourself in a big rut and the only thing you need to do is to do something else probably if you're working on the screen that's something that's not digital um, uh, and something maybe physical maybe you have to practice or whatever so find a space for writing within your schedule and look after yourself by uh, going somewhere else when it's not working um, and there's a great book um, which I haven't got an image for but Mason Curry wrote the book Daily Rituals which talks about the little things people do to take a break from the intensity of writing or in other instances of a creative practice and uh, one writer who has, uh, uh, I didn't find out about this from this particular book, but I knew it from another book, but J.G. Ballard, the science fiction writer, um, every time that he got into that rut that I was describing, he would get up out of his office, pick up one of these really poor, uh, ridiculous non-electric hoovers, which I'm sure many of you know, and just kind of ru uh, run it up and down his rug a few times to kind of get into a different space and, you know, we've all we all know about how in the shower sometimes you have a really inspiring thought and you have to write it down. This is basically the power of you know, distraction or obliquity 
where you find your way through something through indirect means, which we would definitely advocate um, as kind of ways of dealing with the health of my team. So thank you very much. Um, we hope this has given you um, some food for thought. Uh, and yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank and you good luck much. with it all. Yeah. And do like, uh, I think we've left a good amount of time for question and answers, uh, for any questions from you. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to hear any of those. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Kimberly, for your time today. Um, I know we have uh, got some Q&As uh, come in. Um, I did have one um, myself, and I, I think it would be a, a lot of the time people come to me kind of a little bit baffled of where to start when constructing, say, an artist statement on their about page. And do you have any sort of, I don't know, a, a top tip or a few top tips of where to start in the kind of construction of it for an, um, an artist statement? Yeah, I mean, I would, from the experience of working with students who come up with similar kind of uh, questions, um, I think you need to start with your work, you know, or you, you know, and, and talk about that. We do have this kind of triangle of, um, of things you might want to talk about that we have with the crafting business talk so you have either you know you or your work uh um the context that you work in and then what's the other one um the concepts that you work with but i think more practically you know if you're just struggling to get things on the page i think our comments today about voicing are very important mm -hmm. and so recording your own voice having a conversation with someone and recording that and using that as a kind of basis to realize what your you are about as an artist or a maker and and sort of communicate that so that's a kind of good practical tip I think. I think just adding to that as well it's quite easy to fall back on um, uh, previous statements that you've written about yourself or um, previous things that you've said and it's amazing how quickly your work changes or updates and I think that idea of um, trying to articulate your work to others having them witness you talk about it and try and note down words that perhaps you're not aware that you're using that they understand really well or that or perhaps for them are quite odd when they know your I'm talking about someone that you that knows your work quite well um, it can be really helpful to just share it with someone and ask them what they think as well and what kinds of words they would use to describe what you do um, but always starting with talking I think is is really helpful yeah um, Carry on. From, yeah. from that, having the keywords. Thing, the keywords that we mentioned. So noting down keywords and really trying to think about whether they do actually get to the point of what you're what you're doing. Because again, I think we can too easily fall on um, things that sort of sound sound kind of right but aren't quite right. And it's worth spending time with those words and really thinking whether they actually do justice to the work in front of you. Mm. Do you think it's useful to um, provide other artists and crafts makers as to set a context? Do you think that's useful or do um, we need to assume that potentially the reader knows nothing about the wider context of the craft set? I suppose how important is that? It's a good question, isn't it? Because it's like um, uh, if you're coming up with a short artist statement, you don't want to kind of talk, you want to get to what you're about rather than the the context of the way where you are mm. so when we've identified that element of artist statements i think it's about trying to communicate that quite quickly and succinctly what the context is and it's more about you know it could be just something as simple as like uh, what materials you work with or where you work or what kind of studio practices it kind of solitary are you on your own or are you with other people in a workshop those are the kind of things that enable the reader maybe to kind of create a picture. To locate you. Yeah, to locate, yeah. But it's also about having, as we said, we, we've got that triangle of, of um, ideas and it's about having a balanced set of those. So you have your context, but you also have about you and your work and also about the concepts that you're working with. So nothing should be um, overwhelming the other, if that makes sense. Yeah. It needs to all be fairly balanced and um, but it can be quite straightforward, as Stephen says, just a, a, a sentence or two, nothing too over, mm. overworked. But if you think that craft is being used so much in 
contemporary culture. Like people will understand what it means, but it's almost everyone's task to kind of take them to the next level, mm -hmm. which we would probably all understand sort of here in the virtual room, like that, you know, what crafts people do more than corporations, but it's that kind of using words to convince people or inform people basically of this, this uh, you know, in-depth or very close attention to materials, tools, and, and history, and as history, well. if and that's history relevant. and craft yeah. too. That it's not just ideas that are in that have come in thin air. It's there's a whole history and trajectory, mm. and there's written work, and you know all of this is relevant. Mm. Um, but you can't put all of it in your statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's about kind of picking out the relevant bits, isn't yes. it? And you know the yeah, I think um, there's good examples of that. Follow the writers and the makers that you like or that you like the way they write and see how they write their statements and, mm. and sort of obviously don't copy them but <laughs> learn from them uh, and uh, yeah, pick up the things that they do well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Tanvi, I know that you've spotted quite a few questions in the Q&A. Yes. Uh, thank you all. Um, thank you both as well, first of all, for your talk. I'm sure there was some really great advice for people to take away. Um, so let's go start with Ollie's. Do you have any tips for naming your business? For example, when to use a brand name over using your own name? And vice versa. Well, the thing is, got to admit that we're not business people. Um, but uh, I think the same thing applies about mm. kind of smart use of words isn't it um in the sense of um, if you're creating a brand and fret and monge keep going back to it but if they're using lovingly handmade what do you use in your brand i think just to be simple and honest succinct um what was the question what would you prioritize one so prioritizing other so you you mentioned about um names mm -hmm. i mean it's it's or your own name or yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so tricky. I think that your own name is quite good because that's, I think that's a good start, isn't it? Because that's not what the commercial context is. You know, they use craft in a very broad sense. So if you name it after yourself, then you're going straight to that. But um, yeah, that's a tough one that's for us to speak to, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because we're not. Yeah, I think just to, to add to that, you're absolutely right. It's in the context of how you're describing it. And when you are out and about talking about your work, do you refer to the we or the I? And um, remember, Alexandra, the very first talk we did on identifying your brand values, she started off with, I'm talking about the, the we because I intend to be a bigger company with in, you know, um, with more employees. So that was really important for her. And I think if you see yourself as the I, I am the creative, I am the maker, then sometimes when you talk about that, um, people recognize your name in those discussions. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes to follow that through in how you brand yourself, um, you know, you think of Conran as a, a classic example. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's it's sort of thinking about what you want to do with that or benchmark furniture is as another example where sean has taken it to uh, a branded name so what's important to you i or the we i think uh, just i think um not uh, when you use your own name it's not to worry that in the future you might be bigger and employ lots of other people because as a good employer i'm sure you'll pay your work as well and they would be understanding that um, your name is important to the brand. So it's not like you have to stay a studio solitary worker if you use your own name, like the company. But, but yeah, most of the examples we gave of good writing were, did use the first person quite a lot. Um, and it, I think, has quite a strong power to communicate to a large amount of people mm -hmm. uh, as a brand. Brilliant. Thank you. Tanvi, what else have we got? Uh, yes, so another one is, if I wanted to add, um, add quotes to my website, how can I do this ensuring I'm not breaching any copyright rules? Mm. Now, I, I'm assuming here they're referring to quotes from other writers or books. Mm. So, um, and I... As long as you acknowledge the writer, isn't it? I think it's yeah. always about acknowledging your writers. Um, and I think, yes, I'm, I'm assuming they mean a quote about their work by somebody else. I think um, that's, I think it's fine to include that. Um, 
sometimes people in, we've seen people incorporate those kinds of quotes in their statements. Mm. I, personally, I think it works better as a, as a separate um, thing because it, it can be hard sometimes to find the voice in a statement yeah. or know who's talking. Mm. Um, but certainly having a quotation always, always make reference to... Mm. To the person who's speaking. Yeah, legalistically, I mean, um, from a legal perspective, it's only if you uh, put out a huge chunk of text that you're mm -hmm. starting to kind of breach copyright, you know, with the acknowledgement. Obviously, you always acknowledge your sources. And it does mean that you might have to kind of either acknowledge them in text, like Mr. Smith says this about my work, which doesn't really work very well in an artist statement, if that's the context, or in short writing. There's not much space to it. That's kind of like essay writing style. Um, but then if you don't do that, then you have to have footnotes. There's that, you've got to have come some way of acknowledging you said that. Um, but yeah, you only get to trouble, which is like massive Large checks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and another one, so any advice for bilingual or multilingual craftspeople when writing about their work, um, especially when the work isn't in the mainstream or considered niche? So I'm trying to actually... So is that like writing in another language? So it's not writing a... about somebody else's work. So you mean using two different languages within the same text, for example? Possibly. I think mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. they are. Sometimes uh, in the gem of modern craft, don't they? I think, I mean, if you've lots of exhibition catalogues um, across Europe, mm -hmm. you know, they have two languages. I know in Norway, they do that quite frequently. Norwegian and English is kind of mm -hmm. common in a lot of the craft publications and exhibitions. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's of help to the question but um i think you know if you were an artist statement and you had english and then french you know because those are your audiences that's great really isn't it and interweaving both i think that's um, challenging though, yeah. that's yeah. it's challenging but i think as long as you um for example in the journal we mm. have um the um the word written um, in brackets are the translate the translation within the text, I mean, it's it's mm. possible, mm. it's perfectly fine, mm. um, and actually makes for something quite sort of nicely woven together. Mm. Um, it's yeah. a bit more on the academic side, because it's quite yeah. wordy, whenever you have to kind of work on two sides. Sorry, not academic, it just takes up a lot of words mm. when you yeah. have to kind of shift between languages. But as, you know, we, in the general craft, we do really encourage it, because we want to, you know, think about how... Yeah, widen the audience and also yeah. think about how craft is referred to in other languages mm -hmm. um, and how the, there's different slippages in translation. In a recent issue, um, I won't go on about it, but there is, we have whole articles about this issue of how craft is understood in France and China. So it's like, and it's different from the UK when you use the word craft. So mm. fascinating subject. <laughs> it's probably not relevant to the artist statement. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, another question is about establishing a reputation online and what you should include. I suppose perhaps they mean um, how would you start to go about increasing your reputation via, I mean obviously your work is a visual element most of the time, um, but how would you sort of complement that with the written part? Mm. I think if you're looking at reputation um, you probably want to include some form, if this is in the web world, some kind of you, like what other people have said about you like critical reception mm -hmm. so this is not in your artist statement but somewhere in your profile or somewhere on your website you might have a section where you talk about like what people have said about your work you know and where you've been it's kind of when you look through reputation do you normally look at the cvs and that kind of area wait wait what awards you've won you know what uh, exhibitions you've been involved in these kinds of things are probably how you Sort of uh, communicate your reputation. Keeping websites up to date yeah. as well, because it's amazing how quickly, and um, even for ourselves, um, just in terms, I mean, we don't have a website, it's a work in progress, but um, things are constantly being added to our CVs. And, and I think this relates also to what I said earlier that you can fall into the trap of describing yourself as you were rather than as you are. And so I think it's important to keep on, keep ahead of keep ahead of that and always make sure that what you have online is where you are now um, as much as possible. Um, but also, I don't know, um, just in terms of reputation, I guess, I mean, again, we're not, we're not really social media 
uh, users, but I can imagine that if you are a regular poster on Instagram, if you were to have regular um, uh, sort of extracts of your of your writing alongside your work or things that became almost like a series of um, of posts where you're exploring an idea and it's almost like a different episode each time, something like that. So building a kind of story around yourself would be mm. something that I would suggest. But um, as I said, we're not really we're not really social media users at the moment. At the moment, yeah, we have been, but uh, yes. yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> um, that was that actually there is a link, um, a question about a link to tandem. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> it's, so. in, it's in progress. It's yeah. something that we're working on. Um, yeah. uh, it's just finding the time. It's yeah, but it will come, and we will let you know through the past council. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, so actually, regarding the first question um, about the quote, um, we just needed to reframe that question, which Elsa has done. Thank you. Um, they wanted to actually ask, my work is inspired by art and the work of artists, most of them who have passed away now, for instance, Degas. I read a quote uh, by them in another book and I like the quote in relation to my practice. Do I credit the artist and the publication I read it in? Ah, okay, that's very specific. Isn't yeah, it? I think, yeah, you do credit it. I mean, it's how you want to work that, isn't it, within whatever writing you're doing. I think as a, as a kind of more writerly tip let's say if this is in your artist statement it sometimes feels it's kind of a good idea to start with a quote yeah. and, and just leave it there without kind of analyzing it too much in the text so it's kind of like a hook that you were talking about earlier you kind of use the words of others and then you in your artist statement or your piece of writing you respond to that but and then underneath it, you can just have the quote and then the uh the author of that quote and where it's from mm -hmm. including the date yeah and yeah. another um technique that we've seen and that we've actually used when we wrote the um, uh, Neil Bronsword, we had a mm. text that was pieced together by lots of different voices, some from the archives, some from other texts that we've been reading. And the text itself was um, just very fluid. And in the margins, we had the very quick references to who was speaking so that at any point that a different voice came mm -hmm. in there was just a quick acknowledgement but not a full reference mm -hmm. but even something like that I think can work quite well so that anyone looking at that can understand that um, this is a, this text it has been woven together by multiple voices um, and actually that can be quite an effective way of bringing in your your peers as it were whether they're from the past or the present so you're almost as if you're building your team of people that you're working mm. against and alongside, if yeah. you like. Lots of really interesting ways like that of doing referencing. It's mm. not just what you learn at um, university or school where it's like footnotes or Harvard referencing. Um, there can be these more creative ways of dealing with you know, the fact that you're using other people's words. Mm. And yeah, we've been interested in it. Yeah, that's the yeah. kind of sense of work. Something mm. to play with. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I was getting lost in all your words there. <laughs> um, I have, oh, this is quite practical. Do you have any specific advice on writing grant applications, specifically when the words are limited? Yes, I think be as straightforward as you can be. Um, so talk directly to the questions. Often, um, certainly with the grant applications that I've mm. seen, they ask that they have a sort of bulleted list of questions. And it, as much as you can just talk directly to those questions and don't sort of, um, walk around them, just speak straight to them as plainly as you can because um, often the people reading these applications, they don't, they have a lot of them, they don't have a lot of time to read them and as, as uh, the more you can help them understand very quickly what you're, what you're aiming to do um, and how the money will make Yes, and uh, for example, yes, how, how the money that they're offering will make a difference and um, what exactly it is you're going to do for them, I think, yes, uh, just be very succinct and there's, yeah, less time for poetry, I think, yeah. in those kinds of applications, very straightforward. It's very demanding in a way. Um, mm. but yeah, you so have to say a lot with a little, mm. it's really tough. And again, editing, this is where editing comes in. I think having someone else read it over as well um, can really help with that. Um, but yes, grant applications, they're probably the hardest kind of writing in a way. <laughs> because they are so specific and they require a very particular mm. um, content. Mm. Um, you don't want to speak too much about your idea or your work. It's very too practical. much. It's, like, it's quite practical writing. Um, 
you kind of feel like you want to communicate in my case it's like let's say applications for funding for a research project and you kind of feel like the funder wants to know everything about your research but it's, it's doesn't seem to be that way it's more about the practicalities what the money will be needed for how that will enable you to do a certain thing so it's very practical it's very very challenging um, so the, the funding applications just uh, you know do take your time out when you need to and pace it you know you're kind of going through an application and you've spent you make sure in your schedule not to give it time leave it to the last Definitely minute give it time yeah start early try and get even if it says 400 words yeah. and that sounds like very few that will take many many Ages. edits to get to that stage so yes give it time yeah. great that's really good advice caroline how are we doing for time can we have one more or Sorry, I just put myself on mute. Um, yeah, I think we've got one more question on it. I've just spotted uh, one about the I and the we, um, writing in the third person or not. Um, and it, I, I think that was in particular for the About Us on your website. Any recommendations, really? I think I just always start with like, nothing is banned. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be like we've encouraged like playful language, natural, find your voice, mm. all these things. You know, there should be no rules about this. But equally, everyone knows when you read in the first person, it doesn't work. So it doesn't, it's, always, it's, it doesn't always work. Yeah. So you kind of read a bad example of someone using the first person, or a terrible example of someone using the third person. So it's mm. there's no rules about it. I think whatever feels comfortable mm. actually, whatever most sounds like you. Um, I mean, I, I would err towards the third person, but it's only because I'm scared of using the first person. Mm. Um, so that's something that, you know, maybe you could try both and just see which mm. works best. Yeah, There's the, um, but this is the thing, it's, it's, it's about experimenting and finding what fits, um, and you'll soon know, I think. Yeah, that's really good advice. And what you were saying earlier about reading aloud mm -hmm. and um, voice recording so you could read it uh, um, to a voice recorder and listen to it the next day. So you're all a bit fresh yes. um, and seeing which one resonates the most, really. So that's that's really useful, really useful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Kimberly, for your time this thank afternoon. You. So many great top tips and advice. Um, and and I love the idea. Hopefully people will be inspired and connect up with each other to form some working groups to come up with alternative words to describe what you do. Um, and, and I love how you, you talk about the statement, having that balance between what you do the concepts behind it and the context it's in relation to um, and that final little top tip about uh, grant applications talking directly to the questions spot on that's really great um, so I'm going to bring this session to a close and it's just remind you our next talk is on the 25th of August um, growing the experience economy if you want to know more about how you can um, create experiences for other people and, and have that as an income stream for your business join us on the 25th at one o'clock um, and thank you to crafting business oh sorry to crafting Europe for funding um, this, this session. I'm going to ask Tanvi to issue the poll uh, so we can see how much of an impact these talks have on your business. And uh, thank you again for listening. Um, it's the seventh of our Spring Back Talks. Two more to, to go. Um, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Um, two more to go. So join us on the 25th. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Have a good day.